Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Paul Walker. I'm a professor of architecture at the Melbourne School of Design, and I'm chairing uh, tonight's um, uh, presentation. Uh, let me be begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which this meeting is taking place, which may be multiple lands given the location of you all. I pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians um, present today. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Anoma Paris. Anoma is a professor of architecture at the Melbourne School of Design. She is an architectural historian by training with a focus on South and Southeast Asian architecture. Her interdisciplinary approach is from history, anthropology, and ge geography with, an, with a, an additional interest in gender studies. Anoma held an Australian Research Council Future Fellowship for a project titled Temporal Cities, Provisional Citizens, Architecture of Internment um, from uh, 2015 to 2018. And that, that's a very prestigious um, appointment. And I think, I think Anoma may be the only um, architectural scholar to have held a future fellowship. Anoma has published widely. Her books include Architecture and Nationalism in Sri Lanka, Trouser Under the Cloth, published by Routledge in 2012, Hidden Hands and Divided Landscapes, Penal History of Singapore's Plural Society, published by the University of Hawaii Press in 2009, and Indigenous uh, Cultural Centres and Museums, an Illustrated International Survey, published by Roman and Littlefield in 2016. In her presentation tonight, um, called Architecture's Exceptions, War, Borders and Sovereignty, Anoma explores arguments put in two more, uh, two very more, two more very recently published books, um, both published in 2019. These are Sovereignty, Space and Civil War in Sri Lanka, Porous Nation, published by Routledge, and a collection edited by Anoma, Architecture on the Borderline, Boundary Politics and Built Space, also published by Routledge. Discussing the underlying concepts, research processes, and findings of these books, Anoma will consider the question tonight, can architecture contribute to an understanding of the multivalent histories of uh, physical destruction, human displacement, and material dispossession that have shaped our, na uh, our notions of sovereignty. So welcome, Anoma. It's, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you, Paul. So I would like to begin by thanking the faculty for giving me the opportunity, um, and Paul uh, for proposing this event and kindly hosting it. Um, and also Philippa and Daniel who are helping us uh, to um, hold this webinar. The two books I plan to speak about were outcomes uh, related to the topics of my ARC Future Fellowship and of my MPhil at the School of Geography. They focus on war, borders, and sovereignty, topics that are closely aligned. I'm going to share my um, slides with you now. So my research has three key aims. To address issues that are politically current and socially relevant, demonstrating how architectural historians may contribute intellectually to our understanding of contemporary events to broaden the scope of the discipline beyond the interests of its more privileged constituencies and present an understanding of the built environment that is broad and socially inclusive. And to challenge representations of a normative national architecture that is institutionalized through design or history pedagogy. My empirical research digs deeper, asking how a discipline focused on professional careers and aesthetic production might be reoriented towards addressing the confronting and pervasive everyday material, physical, and spatial effects of war, border securitization, and sovereignty, whether of embodied cultural identification or of legal recognition. I am cynical of representations of architecture as autonomous or apolitical, and believe that autonomy is an expression of privilege. Before presenting the books, I would like to thank uh, a couple of people, the editors and publishers of the two series, Architects and ASAA, 
my supervisors in the School of Geography, Rachel Hughes and uh, Ruth Fincher, and those who assisted in preparing the manuscript, Renee Miller Yemen uh, and Mei Yi, Dara Patel and Chandra Jayasurya, who produced many of the maps, and Wendy Roberts and Catherine Wu, who assisted in indexing and referencing. The anthology Architecture on the Borderline historicizes border conditions globally at the locations identified on this map. Whereas several scholars have focused on contemporary border conflicts and terms like war architecture or forensic architecture are by now familiar to us, these previous studies interrogate the intersections of design culture with border politics. I am more interested in how physical spaces are experienced and impact users and how users navigate these notoriously difficult border scenarios. By highlighting the social spatial attributes of border conditions, we gain a better understanding of statelessness and insecurity, an everyday reality for some 79 million displaced persons globally. Each of the authors selected for this anthology displays an admirable sense of ethical responsibility and willingness to explore what are exceedingly difficult topics. The empirical work in each case has been confronting and revelatory. I'm exceedingly grateful for their collaboration on this book. Let me briefly introduce you to its framing and methodology. You may recollect the celebrated discourses of unification and a borderless Europe and the resurgence of cosmopolitan ideas after the fall of the Berlin Wall. These changes were soon eclipsed by greater secretization after the September 2001 attack on New York, followed by siege conditions in several European cities and escalating conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. President Donald Trump's plans for the border wall between the US and Mexico and his persecution of undocumented immigrant children the rise of right-wing politics in Europe, Brexit, and anxiety in Asia over North Korea's nuclear capacities suggested diverse national rebuttals against the prospect of a borderless world. Ironically, border securitization appeared to be coeval with neoliberalism. During the past six months, with the escalation of the global pandemic, border securitization enabled unprecedented levels of institutional and governmental control. Border making practices seemingly imploded, circumscribing our neighborhoods, our workplaces, our homes, and our bodies. At the same time, in post colonial studies, based on the work of Walter McNolo in Latin America, border thinking gained credence as a conceptual strategy for challenging centrist ideologies. This notion of a third conceptual space for questioning normative structures was adopted for the anthology. The term borderline used in psychology to describe social pathologies and personality disorders captures the inherent instability of border spaces and the affected political power. These psychosocial attributes of being unstable, mobile, impermanent, and fragile, coupled with the coercive processes that produce them, seemingly translated into built form. An underlying aim of this book then is to carve out space for new impermanent architectural categories through close analysis of ephemeral border phenomena, such as changing infrastructure, temporary barriers, and refugee camps. The endurance of some features and erasure of others has largely determined what is historicized. Given the ethical neglect of relate, related issues, there is a need to understand architectural history as contingent on these typically transient spaces, alongside the more permanent structures we emulate. This need becomes more urgent as architects are called upon to design humanitarian facilities. The effective impacts on displaced persons' lives need to be recognized. In addressing these issues, authors respond to the broader environment of securitization and insecurity in which architecture is immersed. Rather than speak on individual chapters highlighted here, I will provide a general overview of the content and then focus on my own contributions. The first theme of frontier links territory to geopolitical landscapes accumulated, conquered, or defended for empire building. Such broadly global perceptions of space predate the much narrower parameters of the modern nation state, 
individual chapters examine Persian and Arab territories in Central Asia, the wartime incarceration camps in North America, offshore detention in Australia, and border crossings into Israel's occupied territories. All the chapters in this first section illustrate expansionist ambitions, whether by border crossing, exclusion, or media proliferation, highlighting different manifestations of territorial sovereignty. The next section, themed boundary, examines terrestrial borders secured by nations and negotiated by national and refugee subjects. Here, borders appear as walls, introducing traces or gaps in walls border camps, besieged cities, and demilitarized zones. These borders are mediated by physical spaces and constructions, even though their presence may be temporary. Political activism around the history and memory of the Berlin Wall, the border camps of Northern France, the siege lines in Sarajevo, the US-Mexico border wall, and Korea's demilitarized zone are negotiated, experienced, and politicized based on their respective physical traits. The third section, themed margin, explores the relatively new field of critical heritage studies, which has grown in scope and significance in the past three decades. Central to its emergence is the increasing participation of Asian governments in UNESCO nomination processes, economic expansion of the heritage tourism sector, and the consequent politicization of tangible and intangible forms of heritage amongst various stakeholder groups. Borders figure in this arena in multiple ways since cultural heritage often crosses political boundaries and countries or cities may need to negotiate rights over heritage. Several authors in this section are drawn from outside architecture and offer interdisciplinary perspectives on border space. Affecting memories of border experiences at the Bonagila migrant experience, the dismantling and urban renewal plans for Hong Kong's Kai Tak uh, Airport after the British handover, and the challenge of protecting minority heritage in post war Sri Lanka are among the topics addressed. The final chapter looks at competing applicants for UNESCO's World Heritage nominations in Asia, causing hostility over the cultural patrimony of physical as well as intangible heritage. My own contributions are as follows. In the first case study, based on extensive research in North America, I compared the incarceration of Japanese Americans and Canadians during World War II. In this chapter, the war is represented as an imperial border conflict, and the military exclusion zone created in America's West Coast after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor as a border zone. My focus is on the experiences of American citizens with Japanese ancestry, who were removed from their homes and incarcerated in purpose-built concentration camps for the duration of the war. This policy, intended to prevent subterfuge, contravened the rights afforded with citizenship. And the site I focus on, the Manzana War Re Relocation Center, north of Los Angeles, became significant for the post-war struggle for redress and civil, liber and civil liberties. The 10,000-person camps with their urban grids and timber barracks fenced in with barbed wire and illuminated with searchlights, became sites for a new form of oppression where the civilian citizenry were criminalized. In this chapter, I compared the 10,000-person camp at Manzana, California, with a smaller group of camps in New Denver, British Columbia, drawing attention to their internal social complexities. I argue that for these incarcerated subjects caught between cultures and forms of citizenship, the notion of sovereignty is complex rather than reductive. Various strategies of identification linked to physical experience and geographical sensibilities intersect and become evident in material practices through which they survive incarceration, such as the ornamental gardens at Manzana. So in these two slides, the first one of uh, Manzana, you see the urban grid and the blocks the barrack blocks, and this wonderful uh, photograph by Ansel Adams, which shows you the snow-covered landscape. On the right, the image shows the various places in which such uh, camps were built. On the left, you see the camps in Canada, and you see that they're set up almost like a suburb with blocks and houses. And this is the difference. The Canadian camps at New Denver in the Rocky Mountains 
are quite different to those in the USA. Rather than in barracks, families were housed in shared dwelling units, timber shacks with common hearths. In the US, uh, in the US common military-style messing facilities eroded family cohesion, despite the provision of meals and amenities. And this dysfunction produced protracted generational trauma. In Canada, despite poor provisioning, because internees shared home and heart, family cohesion was maintained. In both examples, gardening that was seasonal and collaborative was used to humanize and territorialize the hostile uniformity of the camps. Gardens have become the basis of the archaeological restorations and commemorative activities through which these former camp spaces are being historicized. So on the right, you can see the Merritt Park, uh, kind of the archaeological excavation and recreation of it. And uh, below, you can see um, commemorative space uh, at New Denver, the Nikkei Internment Memorial Center, which uses a Japanese garden design to create a new uh, uh, museum for the internment experience. My second case study looks at serial displacements as part of the refugee experience based on the life story of a Greek migrant to Australia. My focus is on a group of models of the village of Nia Magnesia, which he constructed from memory and placed on display at the Bonagila Migrant Experience, a national heritage listed former border camp site, which has been museumized. Although these architectural miniatures were immediately suggestive of a romanticized Greek village setting, in fact, this was a refugee village built outside Thessaloniki, one of 500 such villages created following the forced population exchange between Greece and Turkey in 1923. Tessos Kolokotronis was born in this village, speaking Turkish and surrounded by villagers who had come there from Manisa, Magnesia in Anatolia. The new village built by the Refugee Settlement Commission was called Nia Magnesia, New Magnesia. Across Greece, numerous such villages. And here in the map on the left top, you can see how many of them there, uh, there were, the red triangles, the distribution of these refugee villages. Across Greece, numerous such villages, near Ionia, near Philadelphia, built as urban grids with tight planned refugee housing became the basis for the reintegration of the Asia Minor Greek in flux. When after the war, and um, on the right, you see the image of the refugee houses that were provided and Tessos's model of the refugee house. When after the war, Tessos migrated to Australia, entering through the migrant reception center at Greta, these memories persisted as his association with home. By meeting Tessos and traveling to Nia Magnesia to see what remained there, I gained two types of understanding. Firstly, of the complexity of migrants before their arrival to Australia a complexity that is flattened in Bonagila's narrative of new beginnings. And secondly, of a successful model of refugee integration at a time of extreme national crisis that used architecture as a vehicle of social change. So in these uh, images, you see the models that Tessos had built from memory and then what remains at the site in Nia Magnesia. Um, Tessos's own house, which you see on the right at the bottom is no longer there, and the uh, apartment block that you see above on the right uh, has been built on that site. This was where his father's cafe used to be. Um, the map uh, at the bottom shows you the current situation in Nia Magnesia and the location in the black dots of existing refugee uh, houses because much of this suburb looks more like the two to three story Mediterranean suburb that you find today. Um, this is also close, uh, located close to a present day refugee camp for Syrian and Afghan refugees. Um, so this is an interesting kind of uh, continuation of a refugee story. This brings me to my second book. I was 17 when ethnic riots propelled Sri Lanka into a three decades long civil war, transforming my home city, Colombo, and destroying the lives of many. My generation lacked any sense of certainty. Universities were closed for three years. 
There were curfews, insurgencies, suicide bombings, and machine gun toting soldiers on the streets. Those of us who pursued further studies had to leave the country with no guarantee of return. Every border crossing was a tangle of visas, interviews, and invasive scrutiny. But my experiences were nothing when compared with minority populations trapped in the war zone with no knowledge of what had happened to family members and at the mercy of either the military or the separatists. My second book, Sovereignty, Space and Civil War in Sri Lanka, is an effort at telling the story of this period in a way that recognizes these collective traumas. Many of you may be unaware that until 1977, Sri Lanka pursued pro-socialist policies. These circumstances changed in 1977 when a new government elected with a two-thirds majority liberalized the economy. The resultant material changes were pervasive. We went from an era of land reform and import substitution to an import-export economy. But this opening up of the country, the porosity of its borders, produced internal ethnic tensions around the redistribution of opportunities, aggravated by decades of discriminatory policies, and these escalated into civil war. The ethnic conflict pitted the mainly Sinhalese Sri Lankan armed forces against Tamil minority separatists. The image you see here of a Corville Bell from a tiny village at Kites in the Jaffna, Jaffna Peninsula, damaged during fighting between the separatists and the military, encapsulates that sense of violence as well as porosity. In coming up with a schema for understanding the war, I focused on spatial units, looking at how these were impacted by violence, militarization, and displacement. Each of these provided a lens for spatial transformations that destabilized taken for granted physical characteristics. So if you look at this uh, table of contents, there are normative spaces, the nation, the home, and the city, human mobilities, the route, the camp, and the site, and exilic states, ruin, exile, and settlement. I looked at the transformation of cities by warfare, suicide attacks, and defensive fortifications, leaving citizens to navigate a maze of checkpoints. The war saw the creation of a new taxonomy of camp architectures, military camps, refugee camps, separatist training camps, with some of them like the IDP camp at Manic Farm for 200,000 persons as large as any township. I also looked at the ways in which individuals and families navigated exile and loss, recuperating some sense of home from the rubble of burned out houses and rebuilding or reimagining ways of dwelling under conditions of extreme precarity. Much of the material was discussed using maps. An example of it shown here is from the chapter Home. It traces the spread of the 1983 anti-Tamil pogrom across Colombo over a five-day period from July 24th to 30th, capturing the intensity of rioting, the location of refugee camps, and linkages between suburbs and adjacent informal settlements from whence arsonists came. Because we were confined to our homes due to an island-wide curfew, few of us understood the extent and nature of violence across the city or the country. These maps were created based on reports immediately after the event and witness statements at a presidential commission held several decades later. So here you see um, the map of Colombo and the different uh, shades of color show you the intensity of writing on different days. Um, and the table on the top right shows you the locations of the different uh, refugee camps at schools. Um, and the uh, red dots are where the camps were located. Similarly, the map routes that you see here tracks the histories of the north-south road and uh, north-south road and rail arteries during the course of the conflict, as they were attacked, severed, and sutured together after successive battles or separatist attacks. In moving between army-held or separatist-held territory along the A9 highway or the Yardavi rail track, passengers became targets of internecine violence, and their survival depended on their loyalties. 
after the war, when these routes were reconnected, southern Sinhala tourists flooded the former war zone, reclaiming heritage sites and visiting military memorials in what I have described as a colonizing practice. And here you see images of these uh, southern tourists, uh, many of them who are elderly pilgrims coming from the south and the places that they visited. Post-war reconstruction saw a resettlement of IDPs and the villagers built to accommodate them became central to new discourses on the ethical processes and challenges of restitution and redress. Wartime processes of militarization were dissimulated in urban development strategies that used military personnel for labor and securitization and normalized the presence of the military in everyday life. In the example shown here, the introduction of an armored ve vehicle as a public feature and children's plaything illustrates the latent violence in our everyday lives. Apart from my own personal experiences growing up and working in Sri Lanka, which informed a large part of this narrative, research for this book was conducted during the final years of the conflict and in its immediate aftermath. I traveled to the war devastated areas still held by the military and witnessed the changes that I wrote about. Making these events and their consequences visible has been cathartic because architectural representations of wartime Sri Lanka persistently, persistently ignored these confronting realities. Instead, they perpetuated the vision of a tourism paradise. Many of you may know of Sri Lanka on these idyllic terms. By writing a book that contests this image based on human experiences that are unstable and impermanent, I offer a more inclusive spatial history. Let me return to the question raised at the beginning of this presentation. Can architecture speak to the multivalent histories of physical destruction, human displacement, and material dispossession that have shaped our notions of sovereignty? Or will there remain exceptions to what we deem important and expect to teach? Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Anima, um, for um, very um, succinct and um, um, really very interesting uh, presentation. So, well, I'll, I'll start with some questions. So, um, um, I, I've, I've read uh, the book on Sri Lanka over the last few days, and I think it's a very extraordinary story of um, uh, a, a country with a very complex um, cultural history and um, a very complex um, uh, you know, colonial history also, um, and and I wondered whether um, whether you whether whether you wanted to say something about how generalised um, the, the, the 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 points that you make from that book about um, Sri Lanka, how general they can be, how, how, how generally they can be made about other polities, other places as well. I think, for instance, the um, conjunction of um, uh, neoliberal policies, the introduction of neo neoliberal policies in 1977, um, and then the, the, the way that um, ethnicity suddenly became, um, a, you know, a kind of issue. Um, uh, I mean, is, is is this particular to Sri Lanka, or um, do you, do you see this kind of um, um, uh, coincidence of um, neoliberal economic policies and um, uh, emergent ethnic um, identities uh, occurring elsewhere as well? I think that. Um one of the important points I tried to make in the book was that often when Sri Lanka's ethnic conflict is described, it's uh, spoken of in terms of a post-colonial uh, scenario created because of colonial divide and rule policies followed by um, kind of the insular socialist policies that made us conscious of nationalism in a very pronounced way. But by linking it instead to liberalization. What I argue is that when opportunities were divided, they were divided unequally. 
And I think that if you look across the board in um, the sort of soft fascist states in Asia, which are embracing um, economic liberalization, you will see that nationalism is actually growing and uh, economic liberalization doesn't necessarily um, uh, sort of diminish that need to be nationally conscious or even ethno-nationalist. And that's a troubling, a troubling observation about the way in which uh, these two um, ways of identifying with the nation have begun to coalesce and create some other kind of monstrosity. Um, and I think that uh, in the case of Sri Lanka, what it also, what I was also trying to do is to look at the way ethnic identification became an exclusive sort of identification. In other words, um, we forgot the other ways we could identify because we were forced to think ethnically. And quite frankly, I mean, if you grew up in a, a very socialist kind of environment, your experience of the world, say my experience of my childhood was so different from those who came after me who grew up in a time when there was an open market. I mean, even the, the material culture that I grew up with and through, um, you know, we didn't have television, for instance, as simple as that. I mean, if you grew up without television and you grew up with, you are, the generational differences are huge. So I think that uh, understanding that there are other ways to identify uh, yourself other than ethnicity um, was the message I was trying to, you know, get through. Um, I see there are some questions. Yep. So Jennifer Fearing. Hi, Jennifer. Um, she says, thanks for your great talk. You use a lot of maps in both books as a means of visualising trauma and violence. Have you thought more about other forms of media such as film, video, computer modelling techniques to extend your arguments? Uh, I guess some of these have been made fashionable by forensic architecture. So um, when I was doing the MPhil in geography, the use of maps was, of course, something that was being highly debated. And even my use of them, um, I was very um, unsettled by the way maps were used both by the military and the separatists when they were planning battle strategies. And maps were, were everywhere. In Sri Lanka, there used to be big billboards on which maps of military gains were being publicized or um, the LTT websites would have maps. So maps are inherently problematic because they are really a tool of imperialism. They're really coming out of something that is you know, um, problematic. Uh, so although I'm showing you a number of maps, I do use visual images as well in the book. So I do have a lot of photographs of scenarios and I use descriptive passages uh, and ethnographic work to try and um, convey some of my ideas. I didn't use film or video or um, those techniques, um, partly because going into these areas in the post-war period meant that I had to be really cautious. There was a very strong military presence um, even taking a photograph was problematic. So there was a limit to how much I could do. And there was also my desire not to be invasive because I am from the singular majority and going into areas, minority areas, I was immediately viewed with suspicion. So it, it limited what I could do in that respect. Um, the map I showed you of the riots, the uh, July 1983 pogrom, um, that I think is an important map because it, uh, because our experience was so narrow. I mean, my experience was just the lane that, you know, my parents' house was on, that three houses were destroyed. Um, and that was all my experience. Um, whereas what actually happened really was known after people told us what happened in their streets or in their neighborhoods. And then I was trying to piece it all together to create a story. And somehow the map was, you know, my sort of, um, uh, I guess, tool for doing it. 
but there were lots of websites that collected people's stories. And there were the uh, pro-separatist groups who maintained websites throughout this, um, this period of the war, which I did rely on for a lot of information because of the moratorium on uh, news from the war zone. Um, so they did, they did use a lot of the tools that you're describing in order to convey the sort of the idealized uh, vision of this separate state. And I do address that in um, one of the chapters of my book. Okay, um, so we have next question is from uh, Amanda Akmadi. Hi, Amanda. Um, uh, thank you, Anima, two fantastic books. I am wondering if the borderless nature of virtual media and the border crossing mobility of design ideas tend to distract the architectural community from bordering from the bordering practices that remain to govern our daily life, um, our everyday life. I mean, I think I think it's you know it's very timely to think about um, uh, borders that govern our everyday life, given that uh, Melbourne is in, still in some sort of form of lockdown, and we, um, <laughs> we even even in, in, in Australia we we are suddenly conscious of state borders that we were oblivious to until six months ago. So before I answer that, I also wanted to mention that Jennifer was one of the uh, contributors to the book on borders. Um, so I just wanted to mention that, and she wrote uh, with Sean Anderson the chapter on Australia um, and the, the way in which media was used to um, bring those images uh, to the surface. Um, to respond to Amanda, yeah, I, um, I did feel that a lot of the ways in which design tools were used to describe border situations especially at the Venice Biennale where there were, you know, these kind of very um, uh, impressive constructions of scenarios. And um, I, I kind of found that a little um, difficult uh, to digest, I guess, because when you do understand very viscerally what the violence is like, um, it's very hard to objectify it or to present it um, in an aesthetic medium. Um, and some of the stories, I mean, when I was actually doing the research, it was quite traumatic to listen to the stories that people told me. And also because I felt a certain culpability being someone from the majority community, um, having to hear what had happened to people and that understanding of everyday experiences, once you are immersed in that understanding, it's very hard to pull yourself out, even to draw a map. Um, it becomes really difficult to, to take that step back and achieve that distance. And in some ways, perhaps that's why it took me so long to write the book. Um, so I don't know if I've answered your question, Mandy, but uh, yeah, I do, I do find it hard. Um, the way these topics are taught in design studios. Um, Naima, could I just press you on, on what I said um, uh, after Mandy's question? What What do you think now of, I mean, ha has, has the circumstances that we are faced um, uh, with now in our daily lives, you know, uh, about, you know, in Melbourne not being able to move more than five kilometres from our homes and, um uh, and, and not being able to travel into state, um, you know, it's it's uh, it's, it's kind of um, they're kind of uh, um, political strategies which have become subject to criticism, I suppose. But at, at the same time, I, I guess the majority of Melbournians, we are told, accept them. So, um, have you any 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 reflection on? on these practices which are occurring in Melbourne now. I mean, that, that was something that I, I constantly kind of thought of when I was reading your book. I think that uh, the, so when I began the presentation, I kind of slipped in a little bit on the pandemic. Uh, it wasn't in the book because it was published before that. But the way in which borders have really begun to envelop our bodies um, and where we, you know, feel that 
even we, as we move, are constantly uh, conscious then on the limits of ourselves and our neighbors and our homes and in ways that we never were before. Um, even when, you know, like when you are in, when you grow up in a country like Sri Lanka, where there is, I mean, when I was growing up, there was cholera and there was, you know, I remember there were these epidemics that come through the country all the time. And we are constantly, there were insurgencies and schools were stopped. And like I said, universities closed down for three years and people just sort of adapt to these scenarios in ways that are less um, individual, individualized or individuated than what you find in places like Australia. Um, there isn't the same kind of uh, regulation of bodies and controls uh, in that manner. Um, probably, uh, you know, why it makes it harder to contain things, but also people adapt and um, manage to find ways of surviving because the economies are uneven. I think what happens here is that we are having a kind of governmentality that is being imposed on us and it's tied directly to market forces. In other words, it's about uh, two, we have having two conversations, one about econ economic survival and the other about our survival, you know, in terms of our health. And these two have somehow become integrated in the, the kind of questions that are being put all the time and they, have become sort of two sides of the same coin. And um, I guess it sort of leaves you, it silences you in certain ways. It makes it difficult for you to um, speak to either of these positions because they all seem so final. It's almost like you have no control of the, over either of these situations. Um, I certainly felt, I mean, for instance, this year when we've all been sort of madly trying to teach online and, you know, seemingly unsustainable workloads and having no choice really about it, there is a sense that we have had to conform to whatever is being uh, produced in this broader environment at every level, at the institutional level. Uh, and it's carried down to our individual lives and how we are able to manage it. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, in societies like in Australia, where we are individuated to a high degree, when these controls are imposed, they are, as, um, they are felt more strongly than in countries which don't have that sense of individuation. And we appreciate our freedoms in countries like Australia in the same manner. We have a sense of exaggerated sense of freedom. And so when controls are imposed, we feel it uh, to a greater degree. Whereas in Sri Lanka, I would say that um, we are not individuated and the controls cannot be imposed to that same degree. And our sense of freedom is always uh, contained. Well, I guess I think it'll be fascinating to see how, um, you know, what the cultural response, you know, um, next year and the year after will be to, you know, the experience we've had um, this year. Anyway, um, we have another question from uh, Mariana Lozanowska. Hi, Mariana. Um, uh, she says it's a question of methodology. Mariana is asking about is you know like like how do you how do you use all of all of these um, representational uh, um, uh, media and and also you know um, how do you differentiate between um, um, media that you've produced yourself you know we've already talked about the maps with um, um, in, in, in response to Jennifer's question but I think you know really I think it's really fascinating the models that um, as it uh, Tassos made, you know, which, which, you know, in, in a sense, are, are, are kind of familiar to architects. You know, they're, they're, it seems like a familiar thing, but it's a very surprising um, use of model making. And and and, you know, so um, uh, you know, I mean, I guess one of the things to think about with that case is, are there other examples of um, 
uh, people who've experienced uh, refugee status or so on or something like that using media in a way like that, which might be somewhat unusual to to represent um, uh, memories, nostalgias, um, uh, traumatic experiences, maybe um, that 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 y you've discovered in your research. So I think that if in the hierarchy of what I might use, the first uh, set of sources I would look for is what is produced by the people themselves. And so Tessas as models then were very appealing to me. Um, in the work on prisoners of war, of course, there's a lot of material. There's a lot of artworks. There are maps that they themselves create. There are buildings that they have built. So that kind of material is very rich and available. Um, in the case of the um, Sri Lankan situation, there was less of that because the material culture had become um, sort of lost in displacement, during displacement. And there were several projects in which people were asked to uh, redraw sketches of the homes they had lost, and that was published. Um, there were a lot of artworks that were created uh, subsequently about the experience of the war in the Sri Lankan communities, and those have been published. So I would say where you are actually engaging people and you are using people's voices and their own reflections, that should always be uh, the first, you know, the first kind of information you look to. And then representing them, if you don't have that material, becomes secondary. I guess in the Sri Lankan case, to some extent, I was also a participant in that project because I had experienced the war and the uh, pogrom. And so I was also producing information for myself or trying to put forward my understanding of what had happened. Um, I did do a uh, ethnographic study of uh, three uh, homes that were lost and recreated uh, by women. And in that I used interviews and then asked them to share their family photographs and drawings of their houses, which I then tried to kind of, you know, make into coherent um, drawings. So based on, based on what they told me. I hope that answers Miriana's question. Um, can I ask you, um, Anoma, um, Tassos's models, um, do they have any or much meaning to his children and to his, maybe to his grandchildren if he has any? So, yeah, this is a very interesting story. So I went to the Bonagila Migrant Centre and I came upon this room which had a label saying near Magnesia. And uh, there were 25 models in it. And there were several houses and there was the church and the town hall and the school building, et cetera, et cetera. And then I asked who donated these and they said there was some gentleman in Melbourne. We have no idea what this is about. And then I called him up and I visited him. And then he explained to me that this was his village. Meanwhile, while all this was happening, the Bonagila migrant experience decided to pack up his models saying it had no relevance to their exhibit. So he was kind of brokenhearted and we were desperately trying to find ways of housing these models. And I called the kind of the Hellenic Museum, the Immigration Museum, they all said we have no space. They were not sure how it would be relevant. Finally, it was packed up and shipped back to Thessaloniki and it's gone back to Neo Magnesia and they're going to build a little section of a building to house these models as the uh, memory of what their town used to be like. So this, this part of the story, which really happened this year in the past few months, um, shows a couple of things. One is our complete lack of appreciation of the past stories of the people who come to Australia. Um, because we are always looking at the newness of this this migrant group, or we are trying to start a new story about their lives in Australia. So we fail to appreciate that they might actually have equally rich and complex stories to offer us uh, and enrich Australia's uh, history by. Um, and then there is also, you know, Tessas's own memory seems to be becoming even stronger as he gets older. 
uh, and he is able to recollect details. And I have to mention that many of the buildings were destroyed because of the creation of an expressway. So his memory of these models are the only evidence of these buildings for Nia Magnesia. Um, but the third kind of leg of the story is that this idea of the refugee villages across Greece, uh, you find them around Athens and you find them in, uh, mostly in the north. And you recognize them because they don't have the kind of organic form of a Greek village. They are very much the grid of buildings. But within three generations, they are indiscernible from what is happening around them. So there has been successful integration um, of a population who were actually Turkish speaking and had Turkish cultural habits, but were Greek Orthodox. So there is a lesson there also for how you might um, receive and uh, enable a refugee population to become part of another culture. Um, which I think is important um, because the numbers were, you know, a few million people came uh, into Greece. I mean, it was the, but the impact on the population, which was already small in Greece, was huge. Did I, okay. did I answer your question? Well, I think it's a very fascinating, um, and you know, so I, I guess we, the audience would like to hear um, um, the story develop. <laughs> so you need to find some way of um, telling us what happens with um, Tassos as a model, I guess. Um, the next question is um, around policy. So um, uh, and the questioner wants to know what kind of policy or program, um, I suppose political program implications your argument uh, ha has um, if it gets adopted by decision makers. Um, could you please clarify further to help my understanding? So, you know, what are the, what are the policy implications of your work? What are the policy, um, um, what, and, and, uh, and I suppose also what way can academics um, doing historical work like this, um, uh, how can we um, uh, get policy makers to hear us? So I think in the first instance, when we teach uh, architectural history, the history needs to be differentiated by the many ways of experiencing the world that you have across you know, race, class, gender, etc. There's a tendency for it to be more monocultural. And this is problematic. And the problem is because what is not normative tends to be lumped as minority. Um, and rather than that, to have an integrated idea of how any topic can be presented so that we have a highly differentiated understanding of any scenario. Um, in terms of policy, so for Sri Lanka, of course, it's about, um, it's very political, obviously, what I'm saying, I'm, I'm really speaking against a normative culture that is religio-ethnic. Um, and increasingly in Sri Lanka, the state uh, expresses and embodies religious practices in a way that makes minorities feel excluded, more and more excluded. And this is in the language of state events in the way that, and um, it's often unconscious as well. So for ex example, when, ex uh, when architecture is taught, or the architecture of Sri Lankan architects is discussed, comparisons are often made to Buddhist cultures, um, but no effort is made to understand whether there were minority influences. Or there is a way in which this normative culture is perpetuated unconsciously and deliberately at a political level. And I think as um, civil members of a civil society, we need to work very rigorously and be vigilant against any slippages like that. And uh, so that we don't um, subscribe to uh, a very exclusive normative culture. And that I think is the kind of uh, message for the Sri Lankan case. In the case of the borders, I think understanding border conditions as part of the 
taxonomy of architecture uh, is important. I mean, when you think about camps, for instance, like I say, um, globally, as well as in Sri Lanka, camps, the, the, the extent of camps, the number of the population that it affected meant that this was actually a generational form of habitation for people. So we need to know more about what these camps were like, you know, their urban uh, features and how they, the, the fact that they were ephemeral would, should not dismiss them from our canon of architectural types. We need to understand them. So it's about really, I mean, I often say this for Australia as well. I mean, the, the camp is really fundamental to Australia's uh, architectural heritage, but not much has been written about it. When you think of all the different types of camps that, that you know, from the first fleet to uh, um, seasonal uh, habitation by Aboriginal communities, or if you think about the way in which uh, mining settlements were set up, um, the camp has been pervasive in Australian history. And if you add to that prisoner of war camps, internment camps, migrant camps, and offshore detention, you can see that you could you know, write a history of Australian architecture through camps. Um, but why don't we talk about it? Or why don't we discuss it and understand what, you know, what this is about? I think that's my All response. Right, let's move on because we've got plenty of questions. Um, so this is an anonymous uh, question. How do you think class or caste impacted how people navigated the wartime trauma in Sri Lanka? Did it transcend minority majority divisions? Um, I think trauma was very ethnicized because depending on what, who you were ethnically, you were treated differently. So being a minority in wartime Sri Lanka was really um, made you very vulnerable and survival was very difficult during that time for any minority person. Um, and by minorities in this case, I mean Tamil or Muslim person. Um, it's even so now, I would say in Sri Lanka, minority lives are precarious because the constitution protects the majority in many ways, um, but doesn't give equivalent protection for minorities. It was sometimes on the basis of religion and sometimes on the basis of ethnicity. Um, it was uh, the, the structural forms of differentiation were linguistic. I guess that's, that's my response. Okay, let's move on. Um, so this is from Donald Bates. Um, uh, Anoma, thank you for, for the very powerful presentation. How do you and do you need to disengage your personal experiences from the academic or professional position of the historian critic on these issues? What is your position on how closely you can or must bring your personal experiences into the discourse or must you maintain critical distance? I think that's a really interesting question in, in, in relation to the um, these um, examples you've talked about because uh, um, clearly the Sri Lankan book is, is very um, much um, informed by your, your your own experience, as you told us at the beginning of your presentation or, or the presentation of that book. Um, and, and I know also that, that your experience of Greece is, is, is personal. But um, how did you... Um, so did you have any personal investment in the um, story of the Japanese internees um, in North America, for example? And, and if you didn't, I think you probably didn't, did that have a different, did that cause a different kind of approach to how you thought about those, um, that work? So I, I would say even in the Sri Lankan case, because of us trying to write the story um, with paying particular attention to how it affected minorities, I actually had a lot of conversations with people of mixed ethnicity. Um, so I have a number of um, friends and acquaintances who were of mixed parentage. And I found that their stories of the war were quite different because they did not embody the politics in the same way. And uh, 
this was something that helped in writing the book. So I had conversations with them and then I tried to understand what the minority experience was within the limits of my position as someone from the majority. Um, so I would say the book is really about distancing myself from an embodied uh, experience as a Sinhala majority person to tell the story of the war as I uh, felt it had affected uh, people and using the spatial kind of lens in order to try and avoid the ethnic politics. So that was one strategy. And in the case of the um, Japanese American, and I guess when I did my PhD, it was on Singapore, and I was looking at um, the transported convicts to Singapore, and there was no real investment of my subjectivity in that. And I felt that uh, actually doing a PhD on a topic that had nothing to do with myself was actually helpful in honing certain skills on how to begin to understand how people felt about um, the situation or how they described it or their own politics in interviews that I uh, heard. I, I did a minor in anthropology where we looked at the whole idea of reflexive uh, thinking and reflexive writing and the role of the ethnographer. So I was very aware of that, you know, how you put yourself into a scenario, how you pull yourself out of it. But my foundation is, is Marxist, uh, a Marxist approach, which is pretty obvious. I think I look at labor history as my foundation. So there is a difference in, uh, in what I'm looking for in the material that I'm interested in. In the case of the Japanese American internees, I am looking at their use for labor um, as the starting point. So that is a way that I kind of am able to differentiate my position all the time. Okay. Um, so our next question is um, uh, about the experiences of the people in the various camps. Um, have people been able to put their experiences behind them? Or maybe I could reframe that and say, uh, under what conditions can people um, leave traumatic experiences behind if they ever can? I mean, this is subjective to the person and the degree of trauma. Um, there are some who are very embittered by it and others who sort of, you know, um, are determined to move on. But I don't think you can actually... I don't think you can actually erase something that has happened, which has been so, um, so terrible, such uprooting. I think it's very difficult. And when I look at the Japanese American um, kind of histories, and I look at uh, what is now fourth generation Japanese Americans who still carry the weight of that trauma, um, still identify with the scenarios that occurred in the, uh, in the kind of incarceration camps in North America, um, still fight for civil liberties on behalf of other groups because they feel strongly about it. So you can see that four generations on, even though the community has recovered financially in many ways, that disruption has created a very different history for that community because of the politics of redress. So I think the same thing happens to any uh, group of people who are uh, where trauma has an exaggerated impact on a community. It's not an individual. You have to understand you're really looking at a kind of collective trauma. So it's very different from individual trauma, which is ensconced within that, within that collective experience. These are okay. very difficult uh, <laughs> topics to give any, you know, straight answers on. Um, our next question is from Ruth Fincher. Um, uh, Ruth says, it's such important work, and Naima, congratulations. Um, do you think that architectural perspectives are finding an important place in other disciplines like political geography and refugee studies, even as architecture itself may be taking in perspectives from these other disciplines? I think so, and I guess... 
I myself and several others really want to do that, want to make architecture visible and uh, of equal weight in the social sciences and humanities so that people will look to architecture scholars and say, you know, they're saying something interesting about something that is current and political and socially relevant. And uh, I mean, I think there are enough of us doing that for architecture to be visible in that way. Certainly when you look at the scholars who wrote in the post-colonial vein for Asia, they are very visible uh, in an interdisciplinary sense. They're very strong group of scholars and uh, they do see the built environment broadly. And uh, I'm not saying that um, approaches to the built environment that are focused on you know, individuals and the profession are um, not important for themselves, for the discipline, certainly they're very important and they are you know, the substantial core of the discipline. But I think this other kind of way in which uh, the discipline is contextualized by scholars who then link it with what is happening in the world gives it more credibility. Um, and I do hope that, you know, as new scholars come on board, that there will be more, uh, more of us who are able to do this. I, I, would, I would say that in Asia in particular, it is important because the late introduction of the profession in Asia means that um, we need to look at the built environment and the urban environment for our understanding of architecture rather than the careers of individuals, far more so than in Europe and North America where the profession had an early, early beginning. So this is why a lot of this work is coming uh, out of studies on Asia. Thank you, Ruth, for the question. Well, there's a comment from Sybil Frank, who um, doesn't have a question, but would like to thank Noma for her presentation and greetings from Germany. Um, <laughs> the next question is, uh, what inspired Tassos to create his model of his village? Uh, and what differences did you see in his model and your visit to the village itself? Um, how did you interpret the sameness and difference? And I suppose the, 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 you know, the, the village had changed a lot historically, I, I, I understand. So maybe it's a question of what you found of the village, which you could see in the model. Was there anything left? So um, the little dots on the, the map that I showed you were where refugee houses still existed. The buildings had changed. So the church was no longer similar to the church that he had built or the school had expanded substantially. Um, the map of the village, which he drew, actually identified every house and who had lived in it. Um, and this was partly because his father was kind of the person who, I guess, was operating like the town clerk or, you know, someone like that. And... Um, Tassos' story is more complex. He actually was in that village through the World War II when the German occupation happened. And he was also there during um, the Civil War. So those stories actually make each of the models he make and the uses, the change of uses during World War II and the Civil War. When you begin to understand that, um, those models become more complex. And uh, what interested me about those models when I saw them in Bonagila was his labels his annotations, which explain that, where he said, you know, this is the school building and it was used as a place where we did such and such during the war. And uh, so he is very aware of it. The interesting thing about Tessos is that he, uh, when he was in the Greek army, uh, you know, after, after the um, Second World War, when he joined, the, they had to do military service, he learned engineering skills and he went to the American school in Thessaloniki, and he learned to marketry. He learned to make models. And so his models are actually based on um, skilled model making. And uh, he had, because he was an engineer, he, uh, he went and worked in an uh, aircraft company in Melbourne. Um, he was able to create accurate, fairly accurate versions of things because he understood how things were put together. He made a lot of models of, he wanted to teach school children how people did things in the past, how they, you know, agricultural equipment, carts and, you know, 
vehicles that were used. So he made models of all these things, and they were all there in Bonacilla. Um, it, it was a fantastic set of, uh, you know, crafted objects. But I guess uh, nobody really understood how it fitted in. It was like this anomaly in, you know, in a room. Um, I spoke to the mayors of both Albury and uh, Wodonga to see whether they would be interested in doing something about it, maybe telling a refugee story at Bonagila, but that didn't really lead to anything. Right. Um, our next question is from Lillian Chi. Um, it's a wee bit like Ruth's question. Um, uh, hi, Noma. Thanks for this illuminating presentation. Can you share your experience of negotiating your own training and inclination to think through architecture and its uh, preference for objects or icons? Um, and, and what on that has compelled you to negotiate the geography and politics of border and civil war issues differently? Um, these being antithetical to ideas of permanence and authorship, which so often define architecture. So I, I suppose um, it would be, you know, so I think that question of, of, um, of uh, permanence and authorship, which um, uh, dominates so much architectural scholarship, um, how do you think those ideas, do those ideas still have any um, relevance for you as a scholar? I do still write, uh, you know, about architecture and architects in that way. I certainly teach in that way. Um, the reason I did the MPhil in geography was because there wasn't enough of that kind of permanent um, evidence that I could look through. And I felt that the architecture approach was inadequate. And I was very lucky that both uh, Ruth and Rachel were very receptive to my idea of um, of this project and it was the project that they actually um, suggested I do. I mean, I gave them options and they thought that this was the good one. Um, and then they did, they were quite hard on me, I have to say, I hope Ruth is still listening. Um, and they, you know, forced me to really look at it in ways that I uh, wasn't equipped to um, when I came to the uh, geography MPhil program. So I did have to, you know, it was a steep learning curve to try and understand the background literature in geography because we have a tendency to be interdisciplinary in a kind of loose way. And uh, being immersed in that literature and being forced to look at it through the eyes of a geographer, um, I think was invaluable. And it changed the way that I wrote the book on borders as well as uh, the work that I'm doing on the camps, the prison of war camps. And um, I guess it made me think about the abstraction of space um, on the one hand and the grounded materiality that architects look for um, as the two things that I need to bring together. And uh, being able to understand, you know, the, the various capacities of that um, was very important. So in architecture, we do look at the process of constructing something. Because I'm interested in construction and labor, um, the backstory of how something is built also becomes part of my story. Um, as well as the human geographer's understanding of how it is used and navigated spatially. And bringing these two aspects together actually makes a very different kind of story um, to what I started off with. And that I think, I think that from now on, that's going to be evident in what I do. Thanks, I mean, and I, mean, I, would, I would observe that you um, show a very architectural sensibility talking about those gardens and, um, <laughs> and, and, and um, uh, New Denver, you know, so I mean, I think that, that there is a sort of a, a kind of aesthetic um, uh, understanding of things that may not have been apparent to a non-architect, dare I say. But anyway, I'm, I'm just surmising there. Um, our next question is from Yiki Ku. Hi, Yiki. Um, it's fairly long, but anyway, the trauma experienced during the Civil War in Sri Lanka is akin to Khmer Rouge's brutal regime that ruled Cambodia from 1975 to 1979. 
leaving Phnom Penh a ghost town during that period of time. Cambodia started uh, at ground zero with children because most adults were murdered. Previous cultures, traditions, and understanding for heritage were wiped off the map, I suppose, and those who returned to Phnom Penh lived uh, in any abandoned building and uh, in any destroyed structure to begin surviving and, and learning how to thrive in a post-conflict condition without any security or direction from anyone. I observe that they live on with a sense of loss uh, in the younger generations following a global wave of capitalism. Most live alongside great historical buildings built during the French protectorate period era uh, and uh, some beyond, yet um, uh, none of them show any appreciation and understanding for them as Cambodians. How to inculcate such a sense of pride back into the lost generation growing up in a post-conflict condition? Well, that's a big question. One of the problems is that conflict um, is quite innovating, yeah? I mean, you come out of it and you're really, you have no energy. You're, you're completely, it's, it's depleted. Um, so the idea of doing something or even getting to that next phase. I mean, the survival mode continues for many years, uh, probably till the generation who experienced that conflict um, die out. One of the things that I noticed when I was doing interviews for the uh, Prisoner of War Camps project was that children's memories of the camp were so different from adult memories. And this was because they actually enjoyed it. They enjoyed having a lot of children um, to play with, the fact that adults could not control them, um, the fact that family life had broken down was actually to their benefit. Um, whereas the adults took the burden of all the, you know, disposition and loss and trauma and fear. And that generation just could not get over it. So I think that generationally, um, it takes a few generations for the effects of something to um, die down or to become something else, um, become something productive and positive. And you have to rely on the next generation um, to be able to continue that. And in Sri Lanka, I think it has to depend on, you know, the generation who are now reaching adulthood to be able to bypass all the problems uh, that were created by my generation, I guess. Um, so unfortunately, I, it can't happen in the lifetime of people who have experienced that trauma. Uh, it's very hard. They simply don't have the energy for it. And we can tell from the lives of uh, the um, indigenous population in Australia that it, it lasts, the effects last for many generations um, because of the levels of familial dysfunction that are produced by these um, traumatic events. Our next question is from Tutan Ayanti. Anaima, thanks so much for such an interesting presentation. The last picture of a tank and, and, uh, and how it normalised uh, war and everyday life is especially intriguing to me. This reminds me of how my youngest son is so amazed by tanks, but he has no idea what war looks like. Could you uh, please explain, are there ways um, that the war is taught to the younger generations and is it normalised, um, perhaps spatially and socially? Do you see this as an attempt to raise children's awareness of border nationalism and so on, or is it to the contrary? Um, I think that, that armoured, uh, the armoured guy in the park, when I first saw it, it was really confronting to me. But you can see from the people around it that they had just, you know, it was just another piece of the playground equipment as far as they were concerned. And I guess that's what happens when you have seen so many of them and you've seen soldiers continuously, that they just become just like another feature in the street. And um, in, in many societies, the moment that you move from police control to military control marks the point at which your civil society is being um, curtailed, right? That's the point that we don't want to, you don't want to go um, from police protection to military protection. Um, 
And unfortunately, in Asia, the tendency to use the military um, very quickly um, means that there's always this sense of emergency underlying what we do. Um, in, the, in the wartime scenario, what happened was that such a large military force had been created during the last phase of the war. They, couldn't, they didn't want to demobilize them because, of course, you know, they were still in that precarious post-war period. So instead, they put them to work in these kinds of civilian um, functions like construction or um, post-war reconstruction, um, managing of parks and building roads and um, environmental policing and doing all these everyday activities in the ordinary cities, not necessarily in the war zone. And it normalized the presence of these people who were in a different kind of uh, uniform in the public spaces around, you know, cities like Colombo. And uh, everybody was aware that they were there. Many, many times they were carrying guns, I mean, uh, machine guns. Um, and they were always there in the background. And so you were always on your guard as to how you behaved as well. So there was a process of disciplining the society through a very visible military presence as well. Um, of course, during the COVID crisis, then it became very easy to mobilize the military in order to control um, the, you know, people who might uh, enter or might be moving around. So in those scenarios, the military was mobilized very effectively in a lot of Asian countries. So there's always, you know, the other side of it. Um, personally, I feel that if we can rely on police forces, we are really much better off. Um, and uh, if the military can recede from everyday life, then that is really um, a sign that peace has come. And that's what a country like Sri Lanka has to achieve, is that recession of that, the presence of violence. Um, there's a little aside to that, which is the way in which uh, military was also used kind of as a humanitarian force which is also again problematic because you found that in Sri Lanka then, you know, the military who were there first in, in the Jaffna Peninsula as a, a fighting force, then suddenly became the humanitarian um, reconstruction force. Um, and it was very difficult for people to make that change in their heads, especially for the minorities. Um, so yeah, these are some of the problems of that. Okay, we've just got a few more minutes to go. So um, um, I think we'll maybe take another couple of questions. Um, so uh, Rachel Hughes um, says, I'd be fascinated to hear about how your monograph has been received by scholars and others in Sri Lanka. Um, there have been a couple of reviews, which I haven't yet uh, actually looked at. Um, I guess the, the field of Sri Lankan studies is quite robust and on ethnic, on the ethnic conflict as well. It's, you know, very well sort of studied and documented. Um, so at the moment, I can't tell you, Rachel, how it uh, has been received because I don't know yet. I'm hoping that more reviews will come out in the next few months. I did give a talk on the topic in Sri Lanka and... Uh, uh, there were a few spoilers in the audience, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, and maybe our final question will be this. This is from, again, from Mariana Lozanovska. Um, Anima, thank you for your profound insight and such great scholarly work. You have, a, you have spoken about understand, understanding viscerally and how this makes you and others suspicious of the objectifying of aesthetics. I want to raise a question of the author's subject. How does the background and field work as, um, as a subject from that place orient the research? So, I mean, I, I guess this is going back to something we talked about um, early, but, um, um, uh, you know, so, but how, how, how does your subjectivity orient the research? Um, so it's, it's, I suppose it's really about, you know, the, the, the research direction you, you've, you've chosen. I mean, it, it, um, one dear, dear one say it doesn't seem incidental that your experience as a um, 
uh, uh, a young woman in, in, in a war-torn city might shape your work? Well, I think that I seem to be drawn towards these topics uh, <laughs> and seem to be writing about them all the time. But uh, perhaps it's also because certain things um, are more visible to me because of it. Uh, and I can tolerate certain kinds of uh, um, research to a greater extent because I am able to understand it. So the effort of understanding is not as great when you have experienced similar things or similar scenarios. Um, so there is a kind of the way in which the subjectivity does drive uh, the kind of topics that I am willing to seek out. Um, and I do admit that I, do, I, I tend to get bored with topics that are not, uh, um, that are insufficiently complex, <laughs> let's say. Uh, because, uh, you know, because I do look for uh, difficult topics, I, I have to admit. Well, I think that's, that's a very good place for us to end. So, look, um, uh, I invite the virtual audience to virtually applaud uh, Anoma. Um, thanks, Anoma, very much. It's been wonderful. And, and um, uh, Anoma's recent books, just to remind you of their titles, are uh, um, Sovereignty, Space and Civil War in Sri Lanka, Porous Nation, and um, Architecture on the Borderline, Boundary Politics and Built Space. So go out and buy them or um, <laughs> get online and buy them. Um, and they are now available in soft cover, so they won't be as expensive. So uh, thanks, thanks very much, Anoma. I think it's been a wonderful evening, so thank you. So um, can I please thank Thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you to the audience for spending this time with me. I'm very appreciative of it. Thank you. I'm, I'm very sorry we didn't get to all the questions, um, uh, but I, I hope that we, um, I think we covered a lot, of, a lot of ground in the questions. So thank you very much to the questioners as well. Um, before we finish, MSD at home, the, ne the next event um, is with uh, Carmel Muhammad, uh, Nelly Daniel, uh, um, Didi Wajudi, and Eko Prawoto, I think, with uh, Amanda Akmadi. Um, uh, this is on the, the 7th of October at um, uh, 4 p.m., um, presumably to suit our Indonesian uh, participants in that event. And then the following week, on the 13th of October, um, MSD at home is with uh, Patrick Schumacher, significant English uh, architect and, and partner of Zaha Hadid. Um, so that will be fascinating. Um, uh, thank you for joining us uh, for MSD at home uh, with Anoma Paris. Um, and uh, in, in due course, a, a recording of this will be available. So thank you very much. Thank you.